cause all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Well, as we finish out our Sermons on Sermons series and talk about how to intake the preached Word of God, we're going to be talking today about the strangeness of God's Word. Maybe sounds like an odd title. We've heard of the power, we've heard of the primacy, we've heard of the story, but now we hear of the strangeness. Not that there's actually anything wrong with it, that's not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that as God's word comes into our world, which is a world of sin, it's a world of blindness, it's a world of error, God's word is always going to have a foreign sense about it. Are you with me? It's always going to have a foreign sense to it. It comes from someplace else. It comes from God. How can we not expect it to seem strange in some ways. I'm reminded here of the words that were spoken over Jesus by Simeon as he was presented in the temple. Do you remember what Simeon said about Jesus and how he ended his blessing? He said this, Behold, this child is appointed to be a sign that is opposed. Now, are those not odd words? A sign that is opposed. You see, the word of God in the gospel of Christ, which it proclaims, is simply foreign to us as people. It is foreign. It cuts against the grain. Apart from Christ, it is simply not the way we think and the way we live, particularly in relationship to God. In our postmodern world, When truth is being thrown out the window altogether, this is an incredibly important affirmation. We are Christians because the gospel is true. Amen? It brings boatloads of comfort, but it doesn't always make us feel comfortable. It soothes our soul, but the contents of the word of God are not always going to make us feel good. Not always going to give us the fuzzies. Even after we become a Christian, this note of strangeness, it remains. It doesn't go away. It will persist in some ways. Even as, listen, we are immersed in the name of the triune God in our baptism, we are still, each one of us, dipped in our culture. Aren't we? Aren't we? So every time we place ourselves under the word of God, listen, it should shake us. It should reinvigorate us. It should remind us of what is true about God, true about ourselves and our world. Now listen, if you would persist in hearing and reading the scriptures, then get used to different. Get used to different. You could put it like this. We don't so much read the Bible as the Bible reads us. The Bible reveals where our assumptions are, it corrects them, it exposes and corrects us as we sit under the Holy Spirit's ministry through the Word of God. Now, that's a little bit of an introduction. I can think of no better sermon in Scripture to illustrate this than the one Paul preached in Acts 17 while he was in Athens. Now, this city... This city had a storied cultural tradition. It included no less than Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. That's pretty storied. But as Luke tells us, it was also what? It was a city full of idols. It was literally smothered by idols. It was swamped by idols. It is this idolatry that calls forth in Paul, provokes him into the desire to teach and preach and reason with anyone who will listen to the gospel 
of Christ, the gospel of the living God. What we should first notice here is that Paul takes everything that is assumed about a religion, or excuse me, assumed about religion and God, and he flips it upside down. And you know, the Christian message will continue to do that wherever it is faithfully preached. Today we might bemoan, we do bemoan, the challenges of preaching the gospel today and being faithful Christians in our day. But look at the challenges the first Christians had, friends. Look at the challenges that Paul had. They lived in a society that was pluralist to the hilt. To the hilt. And look what God did with them. Look what God did to them with them. It's very encouraging. Well, you might want to get Acts 17 in front of you. We're going to be looking at uh, mainly the, the sermon itself. So verses 22 to about uh, 32, I think. 22 to 32 in there. And as we get into the passage, we want to first look at this. When we think about the strangeness of the word of God, we want to look first at how God's word confronts our idols. Yes, every one of us. Verses 22 to 23. As Paul preaches in the Areopagus, he seizes on this altar, which is dedicated to what? Apparently, the gods know who, right? They they don't know. They're not sure. Surely, Paul must have gotten a few chuckles when he stood in the middle of the Areopagus and he declared, I perceive you are religious. Of course, the word that's used there can simply mean superstitious. So it might have been a bit of a backhanded compliment, you might say. In fact, the people of Athens were so superstitious that they even had altars to unknown gods just to cover their bases. There was a god for every aspect of life in Greco-Roman society. And so they said, maybe we missed a few. We got a lot of gods. Who knows? There might be more out there, so we'll put one to the unknown God. Well, it also might have been a tribute to, uh, on an old altar that had worn off, so they might have put on a new one. Whoever this altar used to be to, to, we don't want to forget you either, so here's your altar. Please be happy with us. Don't smash us to bits. Or again, maybe the intent was to make sure that whatever other unknown gods were out there, they were placated too. Now, Paul seizes on this. He, he, he uses this as a connection point with his culture. And he says, you know what? That which you worship as unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you today. You know where the emphasis is there? Emphasis on the unknown. That's what he's saying to them. He's saying, what you have not known, I'm going to make known to you. Now, just like the worshipers at Athens... All of us, every one of us, friends, without exception, we bring skewed and we bring, yes, idolatrous notions about God to his word and into our lives as Christians. We have to allow and continue to allow God to show us who he is rather than telling him who he is. Amen? Scripture is the straight plumb line by which that happens. There is no other. That's what idolatry is, after all. Listen to John Stott's definition. All idolatry, all idolatry, tries to minimize the gulf between the creator and his creatures in order to bring him under our control. Isn't that what idolatry does? It seeks to make God manageable, to make him tame, to put him under our thumb and in our pocket. So God's word confronts this idolatry and what's proclaimed to us in the gospel is something unknown. It doesn't happen anywhere else. So there's God's confrontation, uh, God's word confrontation of our idols, but then God's word secondly brings clarity to confusion. Look at verses 24 to 29. Look at what Paul goes on to say. He brings clarity into a place of confusion. The idolatry at Athens was all about that, placating and controlling the gods to keep them favorable to humans. But look what Paul does. Well, he simply knocks the bottom out of their false worship, out from under their false worship. 
All along, he says, you thought that the gods were like this, but let me tell you about the true and living God, friends. Listen to what he says. Listen carefully, beginning at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. He is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. And since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. Oh, can you hear Paul upsetting the tea party? I mean, he is just wrecking what's going on at Athens. He's saying, no, 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 no. This is not true religion. God isn't served by us first. In a city that was stuffed with idols, Paul goes before the religious authorities and he says there is one God and he doesn't need your altars. That's what he tells them. Wow, what a party pooper. He could have been quoting from uh, Psalm 51, 10 to 12. All of the beasts of the forest are mine. And so are the cattle upon a thousand hills. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the whole world is mine, and all that is therein. You see, this is what Paul's doing. He's combating what Tim Keller calls thunder and sweetheart religion. Thunder and sweetheart religion. Now, what does he mean by that? Thunder religion is moralistic religion. It's religion that says, you know, you you got to keep up those altars. You gotta keep up those sacrifices. You gotta placate every one of those deities whose number is profuse. You gotta keep them in your pocket. You gotta stay on their good side. You better be good, because Santa is coming to town and you don't wanna be left with coal in your stocking. That's thunder religion. And you know what? It makes us feel really good. Because it makes us feel like we can do our relationship with God. We can set things right. We can bring the blessing of God on our lives by what we do. By what we do. This is the religion of good people. But friends, it is not Christianity. It is not. It is not. And here you might think, just to deal with this for a moment, well, didn't Yahweh himself institute sacrifices? Like lots of sacrifices. Didn't he he do that? Well, the answer is yes, but not like this. Yahweh instituted the sacrifices of the temple, listen, knowing that he would one day be on the altar of sacrifice himself. That's a different religion, friends. That's not the religion of moralism. That is completely different. That's different. Then there's sweetheart religion. And we are so prone to this today, as it's called in our time, relativism. Pluralism. It says, just like the Areopagus, just like what was going on at Athens, it says, just pick a god. Any god, any religious tradition, any spirituality, but just don't make a fuss about it. Don't take it too seriously, okay? It's about our preferences, it's about what works for us, it's convenient because it has very little content, because it lacks any content, it has no power to speak with any conviction about anything that matters. Justice, evil, salvation, none of it. In the end, it has no message and it requires nothing. That's why so many people love it today. Pluralism is easy, it's convenient. It doesn't require anything, except for tolerance. And today our culture is, again, just as caught up in this as Athens was in Paul's day. As we ministered at the Wine Fest just a few weeks ago, I guarantee you, friends, there were people who were offended by our very presence. Just the fact that we believed we had a message that was valuable enough to share with other people is offensive, because relativism is the religion of the day, friends. It is. Well, as we've been learning over these past four weeks from cover to cover, the story of the Bible is dramatically different. Dramatically different. Because it's the story of God's great pursuit of us, not the other way around. Not the other way around. 
If false religion is the mountain we can climb to get to God, Christianity is the path that God has blazed to us. The scriptures are the story of a God who is so utterly faithful and good, so unknown, so different from the gods of the day, that he would come into his creation and he would die for the life and healing of the world. That's a different religion. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It sounds almost blasphemous to say, but the Christian life is about knowing and proclaiming and giving thanks and living in light of God's service to you and not the other way around. Amen? That's what Paul proclaimed that day at Athens. David Gooding, writing on the approach to sacrifice and worship at Athens, says this, It's sadness lies in the way it misreads and misinterprets the heart and character of the true God, he is not in business. He does not sell his love or his forgiveness to us spiritually bankrupt sinners, nor can we buy his salvation. That's the difference between Christianity and false religion. So God's word brings clarity to confusion. We see that in Paul's sermon. But it also brings nourishment to hunger Listen, again, verses 22 to 23, camping on those verses, nourishment to hunger. Paul clearly acknowledges that in Athens, there is a massive spiritual hunger. He's not denying that. Even though it's corrupt, even though it's degraded, even though it's misplaced. Listen, man was made to worship and worship he will, even if it's at the altar of an idol. He's going to do it. And this is so relevant because we often hear that our society is becoming more secular, that it does not, uh, but it does not mean that this hunger will go away. It cannot go away. That label may be attached to our culture, but we are no less spiritual beings. We're going to worship. We're going to worship something. So for instance, If I can get into the weeds a moment this morning and speak into this, why are some of our young people looking for healing and sex reassignment surgeries? Because they are hungry. Because they are starving. And because the plate that they have to eat off of is empty. Empty. It will never fix that hunger. It's not enough. It won't do it. In place of solid food, in place of the solid food of the gospel, what many have today is an empty plate. That's what secularism leaves us with, friends. But the revealing, the honest scalpel of God's commandments and the healing, saving balm of the gospel, oh, it can and will. Amen? It can and will. Are you with me? Will it do that? Will it heal? Yes, it will. And today you can go down the road, you can go down the road to Sharpsburg and you can worship at the Church of the Wild, a church that maintains Christian language while openly embracing paganism and nature worship. You can do that. You see, we can never become truly secular. We never do. We just transfer our allegiances. But we don't become secular. As Paul walked in the midst of Athens, he observed the objects of their worship. Listen, we walk in the midst of the demanding gods of autonomy, of inclusivity, and most of all, ourselves. We have become our idols. And what we proclaim to others and to ourselves is the strange and unknown, but saving message. Of Christ. Amen? So day by day, we see God's word bringing nourishment to real hunger, real spiritual hunger that doesn't go away. Lastly, though, God's word 
does the strangest thing of all. It calls us to actual repentance and faith. That's what it does. We see in this passage the strangeness of God's word in that it calls us to repentance and faith. It is not like the other philosophies present at Athens. It's not just the telling or the hearing of something new, verse 21, without consequence. Let's just talk about ideas. It's full of consequence, and it's urgent because it calls for repentance and faith. Paul ends by saying that the one God who made all sent one Savior into the world for the salvation of the world, and that the next item on God's agenda is one judgment for the entire world. That's what he says, isn't it? Listen to David Gooding again. He is not a God who has a right to interfere in some nations and cultures because he fits in with their ethos and concepts and no right to interfere in other nations and cultures because he's alien to their way of thinking. He made them all. He maintains them all. And he commands all everywhere to repent. As we listen to the preached word, it urgently calls us again to do the strangest thing of all in the eyes of our culture, which is to repent, to turn around, to place our faith where it should be, in Christ. C.S. Lewis said, if you're headed in the wrong direction, the most progressive thing that you can do is to turn around. That's it. Brothers and sisters, we do not know the hour and the day of Christ's return, as Paul points us to here, but we know this, it is but one day closer. One day closer. So the preaching of God's word, it convicts all, and it calls all to come to faith in Christ. So, let me end here. Is the Bible strange to you? Good. It means you're listening. It means you're listening. Every day, we should come to the scriptures prepared, like those at the Areopagus, ready to have strange things brought to our ears and ready to say yes and amen in response. Don't give up hearing and listening to the word of God because it runs counter to our culture and therefore to some of your assumptions. Day by day, listen as we end. Bend your knees while they still bend. Bow your head while it still bows and humble your heart. Friends, that's the end of our time in the preached word, sermons on sermons. I hope that this has been helpful to you. I believe that if you have these four things down, if you understand the power and the primacy, the story and the strangeness, you are going to be well equipped to be blessed in your reading of Scripture and to bless others in your understanding of it. So, Praise and thanks be to God. Let's uh, end in prayer. Let me pray for you as we end this sermon series together. Now may he who began a good work in you bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And may your love abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To the glory and praise.